So I told that story with Seamus about what your favorite food is to try to get us thinking about how we learn. And I wonder if you remember your favorite subject in school, your favorite class. Maybe it was an elementary school class because that teacher, that was the one you wanted to, you couldn't wait to see her or him every day. She treated you well, he had an enthusiasm. Maybe it was a high school class and you remember it so well because you loved that subject. But then the teacher added so much to it. It's what you decided to study in your life. Maybe it was a subject and the teacher didn't teach it so well, but you loved it so much it didn't matter. How do we learn? How do we, how are we attracted to certain things and not other things? Why is it that we're so varied in our ways of learning? Did you know that you remember, on average, 10% of what you read? Right? 10%. You remember 20% of what you hear. So a little better when you hear it as opposed to reading. You do better listening to my sermon than reading it. <laughs> you learn, you retain 30% of what you see. So add seeing with hearing and you get about 50% retention if you see it and hear it. That's a good argument for uh, some kind of visual up here, right? Just putting a little something in your brain. If you actually do something, you retain about 70%. That's way high, right? You know that. And if you say it, you remember 100% of it. Although, Where's Bob? If you ask Bob, I couldn't remember my title for my sermon last week this morning, so I mean I had to really work at it. So it's not always true that you remember 100 percent or depends on how long. But but it's interesting, right, that there are different ways of taking in information, different retention rates. So this morning we're talking about faith formation or our spiritual intelligence. Now let's compare that to, to some other kinds of intelligences that we have. So we have physical intelligence or a way of being in our bodies, right? Some of us are gifted athletes. Some of us are brilliant dancers. I have two left feet. Some of us are really good with that health thing. We know what to eat and we're good at eating well. Some of us are just you know, anything sweet that crosses our path just goes in the <laughs> That we need. So, so there's a physical kind of intelligence. People are talking about emotional intelligence, right? There's a way of knowing, sometimes we call it intuitiveness, but there's a way of knowing about how things work in the world, how things relate to one another. We're in touch with our feelings. We have a, a certain sense about things. That's a, an emotional intelligence. And we can learn those things. If they don't come naturally to us, we can learn them. So I'm going to suggest that for all of us, spiritual intelligence is natural. And you're going, uh-uh, not for me. Maybe you just haven't ever named the way you learn it naturally. So there are people who have suggested that there are seven pathways to spirituality. Seven pathways. These are ways of connecting to the spiritual world, ways of connecting to God, if you want to think about it that way, the, the way that you most feel comfortable thinking about dealing with living into your spiritual life. Seven ways. The first one 
is the intellectual. I think church way too often relates to the intellectual mind. It's words, it's thoughts, it's ideas, it's rationality, it's reading and thinking. Where you find God most present to you, if this is your pathway, is in the head. The second pathway could be called the rational, uh, excuse me, the relational pathway. Relational. You find your connection to the spiritual world in relationships. You love to get together with a bunch of friends and chat about the things that are most meaningful in your lives. You don't like being alone. You find joy in being with people. You experience God in the midst of relationships. A third pathway is a pathway of serving. Some of you are amazing and that I've seen you do your service in many ways around here. You experience great joy when you can help someone, when you can support another's task, when you can make a difference by doing something that aids another person or solves a little problem in the world. As simple as putting tablecloths on tables, as complex as overseeing the new air conditioning unit that's going in. If you're a service-oriented person, you experience great joy when you're able to serve, even the smallest act. Are you finding yourself yet? A fourth pathway and, then, and this will resonate with you. When you hear it, you go, oh, yeah, that's me. A fourth pathway is worship. And I'm not talking about corporate worship, although if this is your pathway, you like worship. You like being here. You want to born. You like being here. But <coughs> worship can happen when you're listening to music in the car. It can happen when you're out and about. Worship can happen when you are having a good meal. But it's about ritual. It's about prayer and praise and music and emotion. It's in your heart where you feel God's presence the easiest. Another pathway, I think we're on number five now, is the activist Pathway. If you're an activist, you want to see change happen in the world, and you're all about it. You're all about making justice happen. You, you want to march in marches. You want to write letters to your kind of people. You're all about seeing things get better in the world, especially for the most vulnerable, especially for the oppressed. You're an activist. That's where you get your spiritual juice. A sixth pathway is the contemplative. The contemplative values the inner life. Reflection, <coughs> solitude, prayer. These are the people that love to be alone and to wonder and to dream. God is most present in the silence of their own soul. And the seventh pathway is the pathway of creation. Creation, people who experience their spirituality and creation, I mean, seems obvious, love being outdoors. Skiing in the winter, snowshoeing through the deep snow, walking the trails, enjoying their gardens, doing yard work. That's the place where these people seem to never get tired brings them great joy. Now, maybe you resonate with a couple of these. That's fine. Maybe there's a couple that you go, eh, but the rest of them I'm okay with. You know, we're, we're complex beings. But growth, spiritual formation, oh, and by the way, I have these on a piece of paper for you to take home with you after worship, in case you were 
job title. Sorry, Julie. So, um, spiritual formation is all about balance. So, we can tend towards something, and it's easy for us. But you know the contemplative who's really socially awkward, right? And, and you know the people that are very spiritual, but they never show up at worship, right? We have our tendencies, we have our preferences, but life is about balance. Life is about growth, is about, you know, filling the lake so that the boats rise, not just feel, filling the lake so one end of the boat rises, or keeps rising, and you get out of balance. Right? So how do we grow in our in these pathways? Well, the Deuteronomy text gives us an idea. It says, put your priorities everywhere. That's a summary of that passage. Everywhere. When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you see? Put it there. When you go to bed at night, what's the last thing you see? Put it there. When you're walking with your people, talk about those things. Talk, you know how we used to do that? Tie a thing around your finger, now you put an alarm on your cell phone, right? Yeah. Put it there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna meditate for five minutes when I wake up in the morning. Big block letters, meditate five minutes. So you don't forget. On your doorpost, you know, the coming out and going, uh, going out and coming in, where you could see all the time what your priorities were. That's the idea here. Put these priorities where they're obvious all the time. And you know, you've had the reverse of this, where you've tried to break a habit, and all the things that you do at the same time you used to do that, <coughs> You want to do it, right? So it's about creating habits, about creating connections between the things that you always do and those priorities that you have in your spiritual life. Now, let's get specific. Disciplines make disciples. I know this discipline thing is uh, has come to be uh, a negative word. You know, like. I did in school. That's how I got through college. That's, that's, that's like being on a diet. That's like, I mean, right? But we know without physical exercise, our muscles atrophy. We know that unless we eat green foods, like our toast, we don't stay healthy. Well, three nights we won't do So, these things that are good for us, that help us be whole, well people, sometimes feel, mm, mm, do I really have to? But once they become habit, and we see the growth that results, there's, there's enjoyment, there's impact, there's satisfaction. So here are some disciplines. I, can, I, I group them in three categories. So the first set of disciplines are the disciplines of the inner life. Some of you, this comes naturally. Tune me out for a minute. You know all of us. Disciplines of silence. Turn the radio off when you're driving the car. Right? Turn the TV off sometimes when you're at home. Not watching the show. Get the noise down. Just learn to be quiet. Meditation. Focusing on breathing, on one word that goes with that breath. Breathe in peace, breathe out love. Just attend, just meditate on breath and one thought. Prayer. You know, prayer is supposed to be a conversation, but often it's just us talking, right? What about the listening? You know, developing a life of silence, a practice of silence, means that you can hear. And funny how prayer can be a conversation. God actually will speak if we're quiet enough to listen. Fasting, another one of those inward disciplines. Do you know that fasting is 
one of the best ways to increase your life's longevity? Fasting a day a week. Maybe, to start with, you just fast from one meal or one kind of food. I know that sounds like Lent, doesn't it? Start it in Lent. Fasting is a good inner, inward discipline. A reminder that God, God's presence is as nourishing as the food that we eat. Okay, the second category is the outward disciplines. The outward disciplines nurture our relationship to others and creation. <coughs> All right? So, service. Some of you, if that's your path, then eh, no big deal. Work on something else. Some of us, we need to learn how to serve a little more. You know, watch what goes on at a family gathering. Someone's setting the table, help them out. Someone's doing the dishes, help them out. You know, someone's doing something around here and it looks like it's taken a while, help them out. Service is a good discipline to work. Giving yourself to a good job. Simplicity. Downsizing. Recycling. Learning to live with less. In relationship to the creation, that's a good practice. There's a reason they call the Western world the overdeveloped world, right? Simplicity is a good discipline. Another outward discipline, body movement. Are any of you into yoga? Yoga is a really good way to stay healthy, but it's a spiritual discipline in another faith. Yoga is a spiritual discipline to make your body do things that it doesn't normally do, to keep your muscles limber and stretched and flexible. You know, those of you who feel God that way, you know where you know when the relationship isn't right because the body hurts. You know when the relationship is good because it's, you feel comfortable and you feel it in your muscles and in your ligaments and in your sinews and I don't even know what those things are, but you do this. You know, there's a new movement that uses the body that's a spiritual discipline. It's called a labyrinth. Some of you maybe know about the labyrinth. It's a walk, it's not a maze, like we'll see the corn mazes come out here. It's not a place where you get lost and have to find your way out. It's a, it's a walkway that has a particular rhythm to it. And you walk to the middle, and you rest, and you walk back out. And it mimics life. There are certain turns that are sharper than others, and certain curves that are easy. It mimics life's rhythms. It's a good body discipline. Creating beauty, another outward discipline. Those of you who are artists, you know this, right? You don't want your garden just to have flowers in it. You want it to be beautiful. You're painters or sculptors. You're musicians or singers. You like putting beautiful things in the world. The third category of disciplines is the disciplines of, of being together, the disciplines of togetherness. These are disciplines that happen in and among us as a community. One of the disciplines that I think is lost is the discipline of listening. How, how dare I say that while you're listening to me? <laughs> Some of you weren't really listening until I said that. <laughs> so listening is, if, you know, there's a reason God gave us two years my words. So I sometimes have to remember to stop for a minute and be sure that I heard what he said before I just say what's on my mind. Listening is a really important discipline. It helps us to understand one another better. It helps us to communicate more effectively. Another discipline that we practice together is confession. Now, this isn't like, you know, verbal vomit, right? This, this is like being aware in another's presence 
of your um, cutting edges, your weaknesses, your areas where you need growth. When you look at another person and just their presence, just their way of being challenges you, that's confession, right? I acknowledge that I'm not very good at that. I acknowledge that I need to do better in that area of my life. It may be verbal. We do, Sunday, we do verbal confession. And if you have an intimate friendship, it's good to do confession aloud, face to face. But confession is bigger than that. It's being in community where you see yourself. Part of what Christian community does. <coughs> Another discipline of being together is celebration. You know, sometimes I think that, well, worship should be a celebration, but sometimes by the looks on our faces, it's like serious. <laughs> Are we sleepwalking? Are we just here? This should be a celebration. I know it's hard to celebrate when you're trying to listen, but what about the rest of our worship? Where's the joy? Can we raise our hands? Can we, you know, dance for a song? Can we clap? Can we, where's, where's the joy? Maybe we need some balloons once in a while. But it doesn't just have to happen here. Celebration can happen as we gather in other ways and places. And acknowledging that there's great joy in the world. That we have all kinds of blessings. Another discipline that we practice together is corporate worship. And again, some, you all know that. I think that's why you're here. You value being here. You value uh, lifting praise before God as a community of faith. It's an important <coughs> discipline. It's an important practice that the rituals that we practice today we're going to come to the table. That ritual that we practice. It reminds us of God's presence in new ways each time we do it. So there are those three categories, and there are probably dozens of other disciplines. I've just named a few that I think are important and practical and meaningful in this day and age. But maybe there are others that you're aware of as I'm talking. Oh, yeah, I should do that. So what's the end? You know what? I'm going to skip that. <laughs> the end is spiritual growth. And there are many ways that that's exhibited. But I, there's this one important thing that I need, that we need to talk about. You, you notice I haven't talked about children's education. I just about titled my sermon, Jesus Welcomes Children and He Taught Adults. There's an important principle in the Bible. You know, the way the Old Testament talks about children being taught was through modeling, through taking them along. It wasn't until the Jewish synagogues became popular that children would sit. In fact, children weren't even allowed in the synagogues for a long while. That children would actually sit in chairs and learn. Most of what children learned was by repetition in the worship time, or by going along with adults to see what they did. The most important thing we can do for children who come to us is welcome them. You know, this world is a lonely, lonely place. Children sit in classrooms, in chairs, looking at the back of one another's heads, facing the teacher all day long. They come home often to empty homes. Children need to be hugged and smiled at and laughed with. Right, James? <laughs> the best thing we can do, now, now I'm not saying that we shouldn't teach children, that we shouldn't sit around a table and have a lesson and tell a story and do some activity, but again, the method, tell a story, Laugh, do an exercise, use bodies, color pictures, make a project. Laugh and talk and hug and laugh and laugh and laugh a lot. 
so that children feel like this is a safe place, that they're welcome here, that they belong here. Heck, we all need that, right? It's like Jesus knew that following him was going to be hard. It's hard to go against the status quo. It's hard to go against the grain. It's hard to swim upstream. It's hard to be countercultural. We need each other. We need good, strong community. We need inner stamina that keeps us grounded. We need disciplines that help us connect to the world, not in ways that feed our addictions, but in ways that we can be life-giving and nurturers in the world. It's Faith Formation Sunday, and Judy Atwater is the portfolio on the council that manages uh, that, that piece of our life together. And she's working hard at helping us get into some small groups where we can do some studying. There are sign-up sheets on the table in the narthex, right outside there in the, what we otherwise call the foyer, if you uh, would like to sign up. And, and there's some opportunities for study. The flyer in your bulletin uh, today talks about literacy in the UCC. There's a one book, one read program in the United Church of Christ dealing with literacy. If you're interested in studying that topic, there's a, a place to sign up that there's a book that Dan and I have been wanting to read with a group of people called Occupy the Bible. If you're interested in that, sign up for that. If you have another idea, maybe you'd like to create a support group because you're dealing with something special in your life. If you'd like to create a work group because there's an organization that needs a bunch of volunteers. If you have something in your mind that would nurture our faith community by gathering with a small group of people and doing that. Maybe write it on one of the pieces of paper up there, or during the coffee hour, just stand up and say, hey, anybody who wants to think about this, or work on this, or join me in that, meet me at this table with your coffee and cookie. Maybe you got an idea while you were hearing about it. Maybe you'd like to teach a yoga class in the church. Who does yoga? Maybe there's nothing with the yoga. Think about those ways that you can grow your faith. And join with others who might want to grow their faith in 